the chat to ask questions. But the first thing is just where everybody's working. That would be just amazing, please. I'm going to just I have a second computer as a backup plan just over here. So if I turn my head away, that's that, that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. That's wonderful. <clears throat> Right, stuff. It's lovely to see so many people. We are acutely aware of the fact that everybody has hugely busy schedules and actually giving us your time in the middle of a very busy Tuesday is is really wonderful. So this needs to be a, a, a useful session. This needs to be something that helps, that makes us all think. Um, so do please use it as such. Wonderful and great. We've got people coming from acute oncology, We've got acute oncology, POW, heart failure support, wonderful head and neck, Taff, great, um, wonderful. Welcome, Dr. Gobinoff from Howvar, head and neck cancer specialist, CNS, wonderful. Welcome, Jude from Wrexham. Great. Fantastic. Who have I missed? Apologies if I've missed people. A lot more contact. Um, Reese, wonderful. Paramedics, fantastic. You are all extremely welcome. I think in the interest of time, because we are in the middle of a busy day. So my name is Fiona Rawlinson and I'm one of the, um, the leads for the palliative medicine programme in Cardiff University. And the webinars are really a hugely collaborative venture from um, from ourselves. So Joe Hayes on the screen is going to be delivering the webinar today. And Joe, I don't know whether you want to say a little bit of our of, of the background uh, before we get started. Um, so it's just to say that I work as a palliative care consultant in, with the specialist palliative care community teams in the Vale of Glamorgan and I work closely with my city hospice colleagues delivering the same service for the city of Cardiff. We work really closely with district nurses, community nurses, GP colleagues um, and all of the other community services in trying to look after palliative care patients in their own homes. Um, so we have lots of interaction and end up doing lots of informal teaching and chatting about how to look after all of our patients and families in the best way. Um, but we've wanted to make it a little bit more formal. I think dragging everyone along to a steady day is clearly not going to work within the current pressures of the NHS. And we have run webinar series for various other groups of people. So want to give it a try aiming at our community nursing colleagues but anybody else on the call who doesn't fit that bill you're, you're still more than welcome um, but we might we might focus towards sort of community nursing if that's okay um, so this series of webinars has been funded by Cardiff and Vale Health Board um, and is is for their staff but other people joining from elsewhere we, we, we're not precious and uh, anybody who can gain anything from the webinars you're, you're very welcome thank you a key thing for this will be at the end of the um, the end of the session there, uh, your evaluation of the session would be really important. A, just to know whether it's made you think whether what's going to change and um, how useful it's been, but also just in terms of us planning future events and future webinars, we need to know what's going to be useful because there isn't any point in duplicating or or doing things that aren't going to be relevant. So your ideas and suggestions for future webinars, then please feel free to, to, to send them our way and we will we will see what we can do. I'm conscious it's just about six minutes past, Joe. So I think probably my my suggestion would be that we get going and and we we really take the session and Nikita, yes, it will be it will be recorded. So the webinar is going to be recorded. Um, and that's something that people can link in afterwards. And interestingly, that's what we found with our other webinar series um, is that actually we, we have people like yourselves here at the main event, but actually people do access things afterwards. Um, and sometimes you want to go back and just check something. So do feel free to use that and to share the link.
So without more ado, Joe, I'm going to hand over to you and I will I will man the chat and, uh, and, and tell you if other things are going on. So Joe, over to you. Thank you. So this session was built as communication skills and advanced care planning. I have made a decision to concentrate on communication skills, if that's OK. Um, and we will come back to advanced care planning later on in the series and happy to answer any questions towards the end as well. If you've got questions to ask, um, there will there be various places in the talk where I may ask you questions. You're very welcome to speak. If not, you're very welcome to put stuff in the chat if sort of speaking over teams isn't your thing. Um, it's going to be more of a sort of talk for the first 40 45 minutes hopefully time for questions and then i'm sure that lots of people are very busy and need to get on with their day um, but we are going to stay on the line until about 2 30 if anybody wants to join us for a bit more of a sort of discussion maybe a chat about sort of patients and families and circumstances that they're involved with. We won't be recording that part of it, but even though we're not recording, that all does need to be completely anonymous. Um, so we'll see where we get to with that in the end. OK, so communication skills. Um, so can be tricky to teach communication skills over a format like this, over a webinar. It might be better if it was or different if it was face to face. It might be different if we were able to sort of act a little bit about the scenarios and a bit about the communication techniques that might work. But it's also really important to have some theory behind it and a little bit of grounding. And the other thing to just bear in mind is lots of us are communicating virtually. And so teaching virtually, um, which is something we've all embraced a bit over the last two to three years, um, is, is a way of doing things and a way of getting through to hopefully more people. So we'll see how we get on today. And as I said, any feedback, very welcome. OK, so I'm going to have ha get you to have a little think about this lady, Margaret. She's 69 and you're seeing her at home. She's got fungating breast cancer and you're there from the, the nursing side doing daily dressings. She was having chemotherapy, but it stopped because it, it was said that it wasn't working. You're there each day or every few days because you work as a team and we're all allowed a day off. She's losing weight, weaker and less able to mobilise and the wound on her chest is getting worse. She's generally more unwell each time you see her. She's quite anxious and is asking the sorts of questions that I've put there below. Will I be here at Christmas? Am I dying? Will this get more and more painful? Will I have to go back in? What if my husband can't look after me? And there's all of those, all of those questions in her head. So I'm hoping for those of you who work in the community on the nursing side, that's a, as a reasonably familiar scenario or something that you may have come across with, uh, may have come across before. So just, just have a think about her and maybe have her or someone like her in your head as we go through this. So what sort of difficult patients do you get at? Di difficult, sorry. What sort of difficult questions do you get asked out there doing your, your normal job? So would anybody like, I, I can't see you all because I've got my, my uh, slides on, but would anybody like to put their hand up and speak to us? So tell us what sort of difficult questions you get asked. Or write something in the chat. Yes, that, or what anybody who doesn't want to speak, yes, put your answers in the chat. What are your difficult questions? And I'll I'll just give you a minute or two and I'll uh, look to my colleague Fiona to just monitor the chat if that's OK. And I guess I put some of my difficult questions in the in the case, really, because I do I do this job as well, going to see people at home who are sick and have lots of things they want to know. Sorry, Fiona, I interrupted. So the chat coming in, how long have I got left? Am I going to die? How long? How long do I have to live? Um, prognosis questions. Um, can you help me to die? How long have I got left? Am I going to die? That's probably the most difficult question, probably the worst one. But in terms of difficultness to, to answer, isn't it? Yeah. 
an, an interesting one from Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. I think that's a really it is it's a really good question because we do get asked it from time to time, don't we? It's just actually, can you help me? My suffering is it, this is this is too difficult. Um, so those are that. Why me? Am I going to be comfortable? Um, those are the main those are the main themes coming through. And sometimes these questions come, don't they, when you're actually when you're busy doing the dressing or 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 for me, if I'm there in somebody's house with my city hospice colleagues, it's it may be sort of almost when they when people sort of think you might not be concentrating and it takes quite a lot of it takes quite a lot of bravery sometimes, I think, to ask these questions. Why am I suffering? Yes. Why me? Why do I deserve it? I need to attend my daughter's wedding. There are events coming up. Will I be able to get there? Or I don't want my family to suffer. I have to keep that secret. Thank you. That's really helpful to hear all of those questions. And they are all quite familiar stuff to those of us who work out there. So. I am going to talk about some of those specific questions, but what I'm going to concentrate more on is sort of tools and techniques to try to help you to, to listen and to manage some of this stuff and to give people some of the information that they want. And I'm just going to ask Fiona to the, the can you help me to die? Um, that might mean lots of different things, mightn't it? It might mean, can you make sure that my symptoms are controlled or can you make sure that you're, you're you know, people are here with me and supporting me and seeing me regularly or it might be someone who's asking about euthanasia and assisted dying and I haven't I haven't covered that specifically in this talk and as you know that's not something that we we have available to us in the UK or something that we're doing or or for lots of us not something that we would want to do but maybe we can just pick that bit up at the end because I haven't included that in the talk okay thank you OK, so whose role is it to answer all of these questions? And the pictures there are, you know, they're of my team, the community specialist palliative care team out there in the community. There are GPs, there are district nurses, um, there are secondary care, if you like. That's a picture of chemotherapy unit of people having their treatment. So whose role is it to answer the questions? And I think it's probably quite easy to think oh, somebody else really should have answered this. Why does this lady not have this information already? Why is she asking me? Because I don't necessarily know all the answers. Um, but I think that it's all of our jobs to try to answer patients' questions to the best of our ability, to try to give them some of the information that they want, to look for the answers maybe for them if we if we don't know. And remember, if someone's asking you a question, they've chosen you. They've chosen you as someone that they feel comfortable to ask that question to. So if you're a district nurse, for example, in someone's home, that might be because they're quite familiar with you. It might be that they've built up a bit of a relationship with you over the days or weeks. It might be that if these patients feel safe with you and feel that you've got the time to to have their questions. Um, and it's a privilege, really, to to be trusted enough to be asked. And so I think it's everybody's role, um, everybody's role to try our best in answering things or to signpost people to it to a different place if needed. OK. Um, so do we need to answer the questions? Well, most patients want information about their condition, their prognosis and their future, but they're often sure not not sure exactly what to ask or who to ask. And then healthcare professionals often only give information when it's asked for. So if you think about it, you've got patients who don't know who to ask and don't know what to ask and health professionals that don't necessarily volunteer information. So you can see that you've got a bit of a bit of an impasse. There. You've got a bit of an information gap that, you know, if, if patients don't know who or what to ask and people aren't going to volunteer information, then you're not necessarily going to close that gap. But if you were a patient or a family member, would you want your questions answered and who would you ask? Most people would want their questions answered and most people would ask those that they're seeing regularly, those that they trust and maybe those that they thought would know the answers. And so when we're communicating, what we're trying to do is to close that information gap. 
but to try to close it in a in a gentle way, in a sensitive way, in an informative way, but to try not to be brutal and suddenly sort of slam it shut in a way that shocks people or causes them great distress. And so I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that might help us with this stuff. Okay, so what barriers exist to communication specifically for you? Very happy to hear from people if you wish to speak, but you might feel more comfortable with putting it in the chat. So what are the barriers to communication? And whilst people are typing, I think one of the ones that we have talked about already is that we're all incredibly busy. The winter is probably going to be grim. And I think that most people would think of having the time having the time to spend with people to talk when I'm in there to do the dressing. And to be honest, I've got X number of people to see and I need to try and get through it quickly to get through my day. So I'll give you give you time as a barrier. Is there anything else, Fiona? So, yes, yeah, some answers coming in now. So lack of knowledge, scared of giving the wrong information, fear of disappointing the patient and their family, insufficient information, lack of knowledge other sort of the themes starting to come out and I think that 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 fear of disappointing the patient family is that's a really interesting one language sometimes um, looking after people with from different countries with different languages sometimes relatives trying to protect the patient against information so collusion on the part of the relatives and um, Charlotte that difficult thing not wanting to give false hope um, family not giving the patients time to ask questions for themselves. Mandy, that's a really interesting one. I've been in that situation too. Not knowing how to approach the subject, especially when not asked. Um, and cultural differences, different different cultures will, will have their different kind of frameworks, won't they, for what is and isn't isn't usual. And it can feel a bit daunting um, when you're when you're in a house and it's it's a bit different to what you expect. So really interesting themes there, bits of knowledge, bits of um, information. Are we giving the right information? Bits of collusion. Um, and yes, false hope. Tricky, very, very tricky one. And when you're actually there with the situation in front of you. And I would identify to, with all of those barriers, actually, and and you know we know barriers are there it's acknowledging that they exist and working with them as much as you can um if someone asks you a question and you're in a hurry it would be lovely to be able to sit down with them and spend time with them and allow them to talk things through but there are some days where it is just not possible and you have to use that barrier as i said to get through your day but it but acknowledging that and saying look i can see that it's really important to you to be able to talk about this stuff i'm really sorry i can't stay today but can we make a time where I can come back and have a proper chat? You know, are you able to facilitate that even if you can't do it on that day? The knowledge one, I think, is really common. And I think we all do think that, you know, clinical care is hyper specialised, isn't it? And if you're generalists out there in the community, you can't know about everything. No one's expecting you to be an expert in whatever the modern oncology treatment is that people are on and how much it's going to affect them and whether it's going to work or not but I'm, I'm just going to give you some tools and techniques where you might be able to acknowledge some of the issues and in the end you might need to direct people to others to answer the specific questions but I think it is important to acknowledge the questions and to try to answer some of it as best you can mm -hmm. to make people feel listened to So has anyone ever had any teaching or training in communication skills? And Fiona, could I hand over to you for a few minutes, please? Is that OK? Just the same person's just contacting me multiple times here. Yeah, no problem. So um, have you had any training in, um, in communication skills? And is it part of um, as part of your training or as a separate course, as a sort of a designated course? My, my typing skills are not a lot uh, legendary, not very good here as part of training or. Or or a separate course. So, depending on 
how old you are, dare I say it, and, and where you trained, you will have different responses to this, to this question. I still can't spell separate, of course, there we are. So Charlotte is saying sage and time. Fantastic. In university 18 plus years ago, quite so, quite so. Uh, Mandy, sage and time, separate course. Um, within management training module. These, the, the core comm skills are fascinating, aren't they? Because they are there everywhere. I mean, yes, of course, they're there in our patient care moments, but actually they are there with our teams, with management team working. And um, Rachel saying university and separate course, um, two day course by Macmillan. There was a Vogue, wasn't there? Gosh, no, this is showing my age, sort of 15 or so years ago when communication skills became an entity that quite correctly people um, thought was important enough to have it as a standalone, um, as a standalone thing. Um, webinar session, Francis Hospital com Compassionate Webinar Sessions, Advanced Communication. Uh, thank you. There's a real, there's a real variety there but there are there are standalone courses and there are as separate um, as part of other things and there are as one's own professional courses so loads of you have got lots of skills lots of you will have been doing your your job and your role for many years and and have lots of communication techniques that you use that work for you and I'm not about to argue against any of those or trash any of those and I think anything I tell you today is potentially complementary to all the skills that you have already got there are lots of different ways of doing things um, anyone that hasn't had any teaching or training in communication skills you will have picked up lots of techniques anyway as part of the job that you're doing and you know it it doesn't mean that you're not able to communicate or you're not able to talk to people and to try and answer some of their questions um, and those of you who had have had teaching or training it's always good for us to refresh and to practice okay so thank you um so this is the learning pyramid i guess what i'm doing at the moment is probably closest to a lecture than anything else and so if i'm lucky you might remember five percent of it this is your average retention rate so to get the most out of today um it would be really great if when we're not able to do sort of much in terms of demonstration virtually um, and we're not able to do that much in terms of discussion, but we're doing some interaction through the chat. What would be really useful to you, I think, is any anything that you pick up today is try it out there in your work, practice by doing. And if you if you pick up any techniques today, try them out on your patients and families and find out the bits that work for you. And that will will reinforce it all the better. OK. So how do we answer all of these questions? We're not born good communicators. We can all learn. We can all practice it. And a good way to think of difficult questions is all difficult conversations in healthcare are just breaking bad news. It's all breaking bad news, isn't it? It might be in terms of prognosis. It might be because the person that you're looking after has got to go back to hospital. It might be because they can't stay at home because it's really not working out with them and their family. It might be that they need to have care now that they can't manage on their own. It might be that they need need to um, think about sort of stopping their treatments because they're not feeling well enough to go back and forth to the hospital. All difficult conversations in healthcare and often in life are a form of breaking bad news. Aren't they? So if you had some sort of strategy with breaking bad news that would potentially be useful. I hope that you can see. So there's lots of different strategies as well. There's lots of different anacronyms. There's things like spikes for those of you who've heard heard that um, Sage and Time have got their own sort of meanings of things to do. This is a breaking bad news strategy that I have always found really helpful. If you've got a different one that works, then that's fine. So breaking bad news. What do people know already? 
So if we think about Margaret, who's asking, you know, am I going to be here at Christmas? And this is a question that I started hearing in about September, I think, of this year. It's like putting your tree up. It sort of gets earlier and earlier, doesn't it? Do you think I'm going to be around at Christmas? What do you think, Doctor? Um, I probably put that back to people a little bit and say, well, you know, what conversations have you had with, with your own doctor, or with the team that have been looking after you in Valindra? Well, what, what are your expectations? What have they told you already? What do you already know? Because that sets the context for you. And often people will, will share that they've actually got loads of information and they've already thought all of this through themselves. OK, what do you think is a different version of that, isn't it? With questions like the, am I going to be here at Christmas? Am I dying? You know, how bad are things? Often often when you say, well, you know, how, how, how do you feel things are going? People will say, well, you know, actually, I'm really much weaker than I was even this time last week. In fact, I'm almost changing by the day. So to be honest, I think my time is short. And sometimes you've got people to tell you exactly what they're thinking and sort of almost break the bad news to themselves just by reflecting it back a little bit. So what do people know? What's the background? If you're asked a difficult question, you don't need to be put on the spot to give a sort of yes, no answer. Explore it further because that will give you all of the context. So what do people want to know? You know, if you've got Margaret asking, am I going to be here at Christmas? Um, it's perhaps saying, you know, that that sounds like a really big question. Do you want to talk a bit more about that today? You know, do you want to spend a bit of time discussing it? Um, it's not immediately obvious. It's not immediately obvious because people have asked the question that they, they do want the answer, because sometimes when you put it like that, people do pull back a little bit and say, well, actually, no, actually, I'm not sure I quite want to talk about that right now, but it would be really great if we could talk about it next time you come and I'll get my daughter to come up and perhaps we can have a bit of a chat. So what do you want? What do they want to know? Do you what's what are the important questions for you? And then if you have got bad news to break, a warning shot. You know, well, actually, Margaret, I, I, I am a little bit worried because you know, this week I've come, you, you're not really getting out of bed and you've just told me that you, you're not really eating and that you're you're really tired and sleeping a lot of the time. You know, I, I, I am a little bit worried that things are changing a bit. So just to drip a bit of warning. Yeah. So if in, a, in classic breaking bad news where people get told that they've got, you know, a, something like a cancer diagnosis because they've come for a scan result. Whoever's delivering that news would often say things like, you know, well, I've got your scan report and I'm afraid I'm afraid it does show something serious. Do you want to go on and talk a bit about that today or do you want me to make an appointment for you to, to come back with your family perhaps tomorrow? So that's a warning that, you know, something's about to be part, be given to you. You're You're about to receive some news that could be tricky. OK. So break the news slowly, sensitively in the sort of ways that I've talked about. Well, yes, I, we're, I am a little bit worried that perhaps now time might be short. Um, slowly, sensitively, allow a bit of silence, allow news to sink in. Remember that if people are upset by receiving bad news, that's not because you're bad at communicating or because you've upset them. It's because bad news is bad. You can't make it good. It's not normal for people to sort of greet that with enthusiasm. OK. So allow people time to react, allow a bit of silence while it all sinks in or allow for them to be tearful and upset if that's how they how they want to be. OK. Allow them to cut short the conversation and walk away if that's what they want to do. Allow them to say, I think we need to leave it there now and, and I'd like you to go. That doesn't mean you're a bad communicator or you've done it all wrong. It's a reaction, a normal human reaction to news that isn't great. And make a plan. Don't leave people up in the air with no idea what's going to happen next or whether they're going to see you again or when they're going to see you again. 
make a plan. I'm very happy to come back and speak next week when your daughter's here. I'll come back on Tuesday afternoon and we can sit down and have another chat. But in the meantime, if you've got questions that you're worried about, this is where you can contact me. If I don't answer, leave a message and I'll call back as soon as I can to make a plan. So breaking bad news, that's, that's a strategy that might be useful. Can sometimes work with uh, you know with things that have a lot less gravity than a, a bad news diagnosis in healthcare. You know sometimes works okay with your teenagers when you haven't got any more money to give them to go out. Yeah, sometimes sometimes works well. Okay, what do they know? What do they want to know? Your warning shot. Break the bad news slowly and sensitively. Allow for the reactions and make a plan. Hopefully that's something that might be useful. Remember, people don't always remember exactly what you said to them, but they will remember the way you made them feel. Okay. So taking a bit of time, trying to communicate as best you can and just being there for them and with them. Hey. Okay. So along the Aligning with the breaking bad news strategy, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what communication tools we can use. So a bit of a toolkit, if you like. This won't necessarily teach you how to answer every single specific question, but will just give you give you something to fall back on when you're in a conversation that's feeling a little bit tricky. OK, so Cardiff six point toolkit formulated by colleagues of mine when they were really trying to analyze how they speak to patients and families and what they can do to help those conversations along. So comfort language, question style, listening and acknowledging, reflection and summarizing. Okay. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about each of those things. So comfort, comfort. So I guess when we formulated the six point toolkit, that was about making sure it's the right sort of time for that conversation, making sure that you're not busy and desperate to get out the door because you've got six other visits, making sure that people are, you know, sat down as pain control as they can be, not desperate to go to the loo, you're not desperate to go to the loo. Um, all of those sorts of things in a hospital setting that you're perhaps in a private room with the door shut or have got the sort of, you know, soundproof curtains across. As we all know they're not soundproof, but they do give an illusion of privacy. So that's originally what we had thought about in terms of comfort, but it's not just physical comfort. Um, you know, in people's own homes, cost of living crisis, you know, you might see people like this all wrapped up and are they are they as comfortable as they can be when you're having these conversations I think um, when you're thinking about a private room and you know going to the relatives room down the corridor and closing the door and thinking about a hospital setting those of you who are out in the community are probably thinking that's not my world I'm in people's homes we're full of people and are absolute chaos and there's people in and out and the dog's barking at me and the, the kids are around but it's it's as much comfort as you can have isn't it and if people are in their own home and in their own setting they may you know inherently be a lot more comfortable than if they're in like a clinic which is your setting so not just the not just the physical setting of the room but psychological comfort as well and i've already said that bad news is is uncomfortable and it is upsetting and it can evoke strong emotions and that's you know that's that's just normal the way we react to things is normal isn't it So body language and nonverbal communication, even if someone decides not to speak, they're still saying something. So what's that little person saying? Are they happy? I don't think so. I think they've got a problem. I think they're potentially quite angry. Um, and they may be angry because of something that's happened to them. They may be about to take it out on you because you're the person that's in front of them. So even if someone decides not to speak, they're still saying something. I think we all put up barriers, as I've said, sometimes to get through the day. 
So I think if you are sort of not making eye contact, busy with what you're doing, you might be giving the impression that, look, I, look, this isn't something I can take on at the moment. It's not something I can talk about today. I need to get your dressing done and, and I, I need to carry on. Um, not necessarily the wrong thing to do, but you are you are potentially conveying something in, in your actions um, and you can you can take the barriers down if you want to and if you make the effort to or it might not be the right day but so your your nonverbal communication is really important okay. so language is far more than just the spoken word people communicate by their dress their facial expressions most communication is nonverbal some of it is about tone and pace and only about 7% is the actual words So in the last few years, we've had all of this lot. And what does that do to our communication? It does potentially make it a bit more tricky. It's hard to communicate in a mask and a visor. And I'm just going to play a couple of minutes of video that one of my colleagues made at the start of the COVID pandemic that, you know, I'm hoping we've moved on a little bit from this, but but COVID's will probably increase over the winter and we might have some of this stuff again. So I'm just going to attempt to play the video now. And Fiona, I can only see you. Maybe you can so tell me whether you can hear. So today about some of the difficulties that we're all as health professionals going to face during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, many of us are going to experience many of our patients who will be elderly and have multiple comorbidities dying during this time. Communication is really important when we're looking after patients who are this sick or who are dying. But we're going to have lots and lots of barriers to communication that are going to make it really difficult. The things that we're going to have to face and get around is going to be wearing PPE, a face mask, an uh, apron, gloves, a visor. All those things make it really difficult to talk to a patient. But there are ways that we can get around these things and still show that we care and that we have compassion for every single person. So the first thing I would suggest is to remember the power of eye to eye contact, because we can show that we care by looking at a patient. We can show that we feel connected to them um, by looking into their eyes. Second thing I would suggest is your tone of voice. If we can keep it gentle and kind, it makes a huge difference to a patient, just speaking slowly and gently. Third thing I would suggest is coming down to their level. If you stand over a patient who's feeling isolated and frightened, it makes them even more so. So just take a chair, sit down next to them or crouch down. Just to be at their level makes a huge difference. Fourth thing is you can still take their hand even though you're wearing a glove and have that little bit of physical contact can bring great comfort. Fifth thing, keep language simple, speak in short sentences and give a chance between things that you're communicating to your patient for, for silence. Try and be comfortable with that silence because that's the time when the patient is absorbing what you're saying to them. So overall, if we just take these simple steps, we can make a huge difference to the experience of every single patient at this incredibly difficult time. So I'm going to talk a little bit today. Thank you. So I hope that's that's um, useful. And it's not COVID specific, is it? We are still going to be wearing PPE to a point and some of that stuff like keeping language simple, which we we're just about to come on to, is, is good in all communication. So try to use words that are familiar for your patients. Some people talked about language as a barrier and I'm not going to talk specifically about different languages, but but that obviously is a barrier. I'm talking more about the you know, if we were speaking English, for example, just the sort of words that are familiar for your patients. It depends what their background is. It depends what they've done. Try to use the sort of words that they're using. Try to match your language to them a little bit. Um, you know, you will find out soon enough if people have some sort of background in healthcare, And in, in that case, you might be able to use some terminology that other people wouldn't understand. But be very careful because at times of stress, even if people have got a lot of knowledge about those things, 
they they might not be able to process it particularly well and most people if they're receiving bad news or in a tricky situation or if they're ill um, would prefer sort of quite simple language and people trying to spell things out in a simple and honest way. Um, remembering things is tricky. I'm sure lots of you have spoken with patients that have received bad news, perhaps in a hospital setting and sort of said things like, well, the doctor told me the scan result and I can't remember anything else they said. I don't know what's happening now. Didn't take any of it in. Yeah, so go slowly and try to recap. So keep your language simple. Question style. The sort of questions that you use can make a difference to communication open questions how are you how are you managing how do you think things are going they get you loads and loads of information useful at the start of a discussion okay focused questions are as they say more focused down tell me more about how things are at home you said your husband was struggling closed questions are very specific yes no response is your pain better with the new tablets and leading questions, you must be feeling much better now that you're home from hospital. And that's leading people to say, oh, yes, when actually they might not be. They might be really frightened or they might be feeling much more, much, much more unwell than when they first came home. So open questions will get you lots and lots of information. Lots of people might be thinking, well, that's all very well, but I've only got seven minutes to do this. Um, you know, if you're a GP, seven to ten minutes in your consultation. If I start asking open questions, we'll be here all day. Um, that's what lots of people might think, but actually it's quite time efficient because if you ask an open question, you potentially get lots and lots of information back that would have taken you another 20 minutes by asking very specific and closed questions. How's the pain? How's the nausea and vomiting? How, how's your husband? How are you managing? Have you taken these tablets? Have you taken these tablets? Yeah. So open questions, big funnel that gives you loads and loads of information and can be can be quite time efficient. And then later on, you can sort of focus down a little bit about the stuff that you need to know. Okay. Hypothetical questions can be can be really, really helpful in getting information. They're sort of what if questions, aren't they? And they don't put people on the spot quite so much if, if the conversation's a little bit difficult. So I, I know that you've focused on on getting better and getting to your next cycle of chemotherapy and feeling a bit stronger and building yourself up. And, and that's great. You know, happy to work with you on that. But have you ever thought about how you would manage if, if you weren't picking up, if you weren't getting better and how we would deal with things then? OK. Have you ever wondered what might happen if, if this treatment doesn't work and how 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 you would manage then? Or if it wasn't working out at home, have you ever wondered about anywhere else that you might like to be looked after? Um, or you could even make the question about somebody else completely. You know, sometimes as a doctor, I would sometimes say, well, when I've when I've looked after other people in similar situations to this, where where home is really really difficult they have found it helpful to talk through some of the other options like coming into the hospice for a short period of time perhaps or thinking about another healthcare setting like a nursing home is that something that you would like to talk about and sometimes people will will pick up on that bit and take the conversation forward then so yeah effective tool in in getting people to discuss and engage with difficult issues doesn't always work nothing works 100 percent of the time but just tools and tricks that you can try okay so question style we've talked about open questions a big funnel which gets you loads of information and you can focus later and the hypothetical questions which can take you off in, in a slightly different route so listening and acknowledging, try to listen to people. So just sitting here talking and talking is, is not comfortable for me. Um, the 80-20 rule. So that's trying to let your patients or families talk for 80% of the time. So try not to interrupt. Try not to do too much of the talking yourself. And then you'll get lots and lots of information back. Acknowledge the difficult things that you're getting back so you can't fix everything. And it's in it's in us all as healthcare professionals to want to fix all of the problems. But but you can't. Um, it's not possible to fix everybody's problems, but just acknowledging it can be really, really powerful and show empathy. 
So I can see that this is a really difficult time for you. What can I do to help today? Well, that's a really difficult question to ask. What's making you ask that right now? So acknowledge, empathise, listen. So reflection, the last bit of, or the fifth bit of the toolkit. Okay, and this is from one of our active patients. Good use of reflection is important. It makes people feel that you're listening to them. So it's reflecting things back from the conversations to give you more information. We've always had a close relationship and talked about most things. Most things? Yeah, she used to talk to me about everything. When she was first diagnosed, I remember her saying that she'd like to be at home at the end. So you've just got lots of information from just, just repeating a couple of words that they've said to you. Reflection. So. I've been thinking about things you've mentioned, her deterioration, her weakness, how her breathe, and now her breathing, it's all so very difficult. Difficult? Well, yes. So very difficult to know what to do for the best. What do you think I should do? I want her to be comfortable. It's just facilitating that conversation. The one word from you has given you a load more back. So reflection's useful. And summarising, the last bit of the toolkit, really, really useful where you're sort of unsure where to go in a consultation or an interaction. Your mind's going blank. You're suddenly talking about something that happened in 1963 or people are telling you about their, their second cousin's wife's story about when they were unwell and you need to get it back on track a little bit. So what you're saying is. You're feeling weaker, you're more tired. You've got more pain in your chest, you're sleeping more and, you, and you're worried about the future and you think things might be changing. Is there anything else? I know that that's enough. But is there anything else that's really important for us to talk about at the moment? So it just help you to, to see where you have got to. So it's just taking the salient features, demonstrating that you have listened. And if there's something that you've missed in your summary list, you can say, is there anything else? Is there anything that I've missed? So it's a little bit of a checkbox for you as well that you've got all of the important bits. And as I said, when you're, you're a bit lost in your consultation and you're stuck and you don't know where to go, it's kind of stopping for a minute and taking stock, if you like, of, of what you have talked about and where you are. So we've talked about her pain, the need for a catheter, the medicines, and you've mentioned her not wanting anything heroic done. Can we please go back and talk a little bit more about that? Oh, yes. I think she meant, you know, not wanting to try, not trying to bring her back. So just lots of information, a bit of a summary to see where you've got to. It gives you a time, a, a, a moment to think about where you go next. There we are. Those are some of the tools that might be helpful in the difficult conversations that you may have to have. Comfort language, questioning style, listening and acknowledging, reflecting and summarising. I feel like I've talked a lot, Fiona. I have got a few more slides, but shall I just pause and see if anybody has any questions or comments or violent disagreement with me or anything really that they would like would like to say. It's um, time check as it's 10 to 2. So folks do, okay. we can, if you put your hand up, we can see that if you want to ask a question or or just again, reflect on anything that Joe has been saying or write anything in the chat. Just we go on. I was just thinking back to the comment about helping the person perhaps who wants help to end their life. And that's a classic situation of where the asking another question is really so useful. So it would be that, you know, that's a really deep question or that's a really difficult question. What, yes, what made you ask that now can just open things up hugely. But yes, anybody got anything else, anything else they want to ask or add? Um, Charlotte's saying that the phrase empathy builds rapport. It's simple, but but actually something perhaps that people hadn't thought of before. 
and that, I think that's right. I also think that that active listening bit and the reflect, I think the reflecting of words back to open up conversations is really useful because it, it demonstrates that you are listening. You might be doing addressing, taking a blood pressure, but you are focused and concentrating on what's going on and that will that will help um, to build the rapport as well, to build that trust, which opens up more conversations so often. Anything else from folks? Thumbs up for that, Charlotte, definitely. So while you're thinking, folks, why don't just in the thinking, thinking around time, Joe, why don't you go on and do your the, the, the last few slides and people do people add things into the chat if you want to bring them up at our next stopping point? So I think lots of people said their difficult question was how long? How long have I got? And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that specifically. And um, as before, no one is expecting you to be an expert in whatever it is that is shortening their life, some sort of cancer, some sort of other condition. You know, you, you're not expected to know the ins and outs of that, um, but you can still talk to people about time scales and have some sort of honest discussion about about the future. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about things that might help in that situation. So that there's, we'll go past this slide, but that's just summarising the six point toolkit and your breaking bad news strategy. So difficult questions can this be treated. I'm going to die. How long? What will happen? And these were Margaret's questions, aren't they? Will I be here at Christmas? Will it get more and more painful? Will I have to go back in? Um, so will it get more and more painful? I think, you know, you can reassure people if pain hasn't been an issue so far, it might not be an issue. It's not inevitable that things get more and more painful. But if pain is a problem, then I can help you. There are lots of different painkillers and routes that we can use. And we've got the nurses from City Hospice that can come regularly and we can talk to your own doctor. And there are lots of things that we can do to help you to be comfortable. So you haven't promised that people are going to be 100% pain free, but you've also hopefully reassured them that you're there with them and that you're there, their comfort will be your, your priority. OK. Will I have to go back into hospital? That's supposed to mean um, so that's a little bit about advanced care planning, which kind of isn't isn't something that we can fit in today, but we will talk about more in this series of webinars. It depends, doesn't it? It depends what that person wants and what we know about their wishes. It depends on why it's being suggested and whether there's likely benefit to being in somewhere like a hospital setting or whether, in fact, that's not actually going to benefit them and will just mean 24 hours in A&E. Um, and that will be distressing for everybody. Um, so it depends on the situation, doesn't it? What if my husband can't look after me? Well, you know, those of you who work out in the community, social care is tricky and there are long waits, but you do know the answers to those questions about what options might be available and trying to plan ahead. So in terms of prognosis questions, it's all dealing with uncertainty, isn't it? So the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty that you can comfortably live with is, is a, it's a quote that uh, rings quite true for me. We all live with uncertainty. Sometimes it matters more than others and some people deal with it better than others. Depending on the circumstances. So it's good to acknowledge uncertainty. It will be easier for us all if I could give you clear answers. Prognosis is only ever our best guess. However, if you're looking at somebody deteriorating by the day and they're asking whether they're going to sort of get to America in six months time, it's perhaps, you know, perhaps a little bit unfair to say, well, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I can't tell you about prognosis. It's perhaps better to be a little bit honest and realistic if you feel that you can. It's plan for the worst, but hope for the best is something that a technique that can be useful. So I know that you um, are really keen to go back and have more treatment and to build yourself up and you're really positive about that. And that's great. But if. If that's not really working out that way, can we sort of have a plan B about what we might do if things aren't improving in the way that you would hope? So that's not taking away people's hope, even if it's slightly unrealistic, but it's also getting them to plan. OK. 
And would you would you like to talk through markers of recurrence deterioration? So, you know, that's saying things like, well, you know, sleeping more and feeling weak and not having much of an appetite might mean that things are moving on a bit. So this is something that I think is is really helpful. Um, I've just put the book up there because Robert Twycross is the person I think that that talked about this um, this way of looking at things. If someone's deteriorating by the month and steadily doing so, then they may have a prognosis in terms of months. If they're deteriorating by the week, then maybe in terms of weeks. And if they're deteriorating by deteriorating by the day then perhaps their prognosis is in terms of days and if put your CHC fast track one fast track two sort of criteria there those are the those of you who are filling in this sort of paperwork in the community and having to think in these terms that's what that's what we're thinking aren't we are they deteriorating by the day are they deteriorating by the week so when someone asks you how long you might be able to say well how do you see things how are you compared to say this time last month Oh, well, you know, I'm much worse. In fact, I think, you know, each week I'm 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 getting getting able to do less. And then people have kind of told you how they see things. This only works if people are deteriorating in a sort of steady way and not in a sort of rapidly up and down way. Like if they've got a severe infection or something and they suddenly look really poorly and then may potentially improve with treatment. So it works. doesn't work quite so well then. But for sort of progressive conditions, when there's a gradual deterioration, then trying to put it in this sort of time context might be helpful. And that might enable you to say something in answer to the am I going to be here at Christmas? That's a little bit honest and realistic rather than, well, I don't know. None of us know. Um, so that might be useful. So I realise I haven't given you um, an answer to every single difficult question, but hopefully giving you some tools that you can use in your day to day practice that will hopefully be helpful going forward. And there we are. If you want to do more communication skills, this is a, a shameless plug for uh, CompSkills two days that Fiona and I will be running in March for anyone who is interested. Um, and I'll just leave that up there for a second so people can have a little look. That was probably about all I wanted to say for now. Um, questions, comments, anything you would like to say? And I can't see anyone, so I'm just going to hand over to Fiona for a little bit, if that's all right. Fab. Thank you very much, Joe. And I put a couple of things in the chat. Um, there's one question coming up, but I've posted a, a link to some useful resources on advanced and future care planning. And I've also posted a link to the Cardiff University CPD channel on which lots of our previous palliative care webinars are. So if this is the only one of this series that you can get to, there is other free CPD out there on the Cardiff University CPD channel. So do feel free to have a browse. And Charlotte's put the booking link for the ComSkills course on the chat channel. But while the links are going up, um, the one question or one comment that's come up from Jane is just around collusion and and just that particularly collusion between family members can sometimes be quite challenging to deal with, um, especially if, you know, and I think certainly if, you, if you're focused on getting the communication as good as it can be with the patient and then there's family is there and like Joe working in the community or in the front room of the house and you can hear people chuntering and chuntering in the kitchen or standing in the front, standing in the doorway of the room where you're trying to have a, have a conversation with the patient. But um, Joe, I don't know if you've got any sort of quick top tips or hints around collusion, managing collusion. Um, so collusion classically is a sort of, you know, you go in through the door and the, the relatives drag you into the living room before you're allowed upstairs to see the person who's pretty poorly and says, oh, they, they don't know. I don't, we don't want you to say anything, um, you know, about that they've got cancer or that they're dying or that whatever it is and um, that's the classic sort of collusion scenario I think um, it does happen um, usually the relatives or the partner whoever it is is trying is is at trying to act in that person's best interests they're not normally trying to be difficult or evil they're normally trying to do it to protect somebody that they love so acknowledging that is is really useful and trying to put yourself on 
on their side and not into conflict with them, I think is really helpful. So I potentially would go into the living room, sit down with them and say, so can I just ask a little bit more about, you know, things from your point of view? How are you finding things? Is your relative, wife, friend, whoever sort of asking questions? Um, and get, get as much information as you can then say and you might be able to then talk a little bit around well well you know you've told me that they're sort of asking a few questions and you've you've reassured them that they're going to get better but you know do you, do you think do you think that they they are doubting that themselves from time to time you know you've told me that they're an intelligent person and and you know that they looked after their own mother when they were really poorly you know do do you think that they might be starting to think that things are not so good themselves and and you know therefore do we owe it to them a little bit to, to try and answer some of their questions and you know also it's difficult for relationships if there's a sort of conspiracy and, a, and secrecy going on in a time where it's probably helpful for families to to be as close as they can really um and not have have secrets to keep and feel that they're stepping on eggshells of things that they can and can't say so you know do you think it would help you to be able to support each other more if if we're able to talk about things a bit more out in the open and do you think it would help them to be able to plan you know it might be really important that they sort out their affairs and and they may not do that unless they realize that the situation's serious really so there's a sort of some of my comments Thank you. Anybody do, yes, I was going to say, do please add add anything in the chat. But I think you're right. It's so very often collusion is about care. Collusion is around people caring for the person that is affected by whatever the condition is, and don't you know they they don't want additional they don't want additional hurt or additional distress, and they might be worried about how they will handle that person's distress but actually the secrets within families as the end of life draws near particularly can be terribly divisive and then not helpful when it comes to bereavement and going through bereavement and we'll talk about that in the last session of the series. I guess and we do have a duty of care to people in the end don't we and we you know you can't sort of refuse to to answer questions that they're they're asking but if you've had a chat beforehand with the relative that's trying to collude and then and then gone to see them perhaps with that relative with you so they can see the sort of questions that mm. you know their loved one is asking that can help to facilitate it and often you'd put all the groundwork in with the relative that wants to collude and then you'll sort of go upstairs and say or you know do you have any questions do you want to talk about things in a bit more detail and people often say no no I don't want to talk about anything you just go back downstairs and talk to my daughter I don't want to know um, that sometimes happens too I think the um I, th I think it it's the bit about the duty of care isn't it and and the it it some people say well if i'm not allowed to talk to relatives without talking to the fact to, to the patient first and the, yes the duty of care is to the patient but if you think about it we're trying to get everybody on the same page so listening to what relatives have to say is is can be really important and it, it they may just want to listen to how you've asked the questions because they may have had a really difficult experience with healthcare professionals in different settings and they may just not want to have um distress caused again so so actually not hiding anything obviously with the patient's permission bringing family in you know should we go up and see together then then that can sometimes actually be the simplest thing to do to help um, to help smooth things over. I'm conscious of time. We're at, we're at five past two, so I'm sure that a number of people, I mean, it's wonderful that so many have stayed on past the witching hour of two o'clock. Um, but Charlotte, I wonder if you could pop the link around for evaluation in um, into the chat. Um, but I wonder whether we should bring the kind of the formal part of this webinar to a close. Um, but just to say and we will stay on the line so if people have got particular questions and challenging situations they want to just have a moment to voice then do please feel to stay on the call 
but we have a, a webinar next week and the main symptom, the main focus of next week is around pain and nausea and vomiting. I feel certain that communication is going to come into it because it always does. Um, but again, same time, same place next week and people are extremely welcome to join. But do please fill the evaluation format because we need to know what's useful. And if we've got scope to do more series of webinars, we need to know what's going to be the most useful. Jo, is there anything else finally before we stop the recording? I don't think so. If anybody wants to stay on this call to sort of chat to us a bit more informally and to ask us questions and to talk about patients in an anonymised way, that's absolutely fine. And we, we're not going to record this part of it. Thank you. In fact, I will.